Hello and welcome to Show and Tell with me, Stephen Leslie, the series where I show you some photos and then proceed to soak you in a veritable downpour of nonsense about them. Uh, this is episode 10. Amazing, who would have thought it? And uh, it also it's the first episode of 2023. So Happy New Year to everyone. Thanks for watching. Uh, and the more observant of you would have probably noticed by now that I am doing this episode from my bathroom. Why are you in your bathroom, Stephen? I hear you say. Well, um, the reason I'm in my rather echoey bathroom now that I come to film in it is that um, I was going to try and do an episode on celebratory New Year's Eve photos. Uh, so like this one by the great Leonard Freed, taken on the escalator at Grand Central Station in New York, New Year's Eve 1969. But for all the great New Year's Eve photos like that, or this one taken in the Royal Albert Hall, in 1947 of a very strange demonic fancy dress party. Most of these type of photos are just of twatted people gurning for the camera. So this one's from a party in a London hotel in 1929 and this one is from a nightclub in Scunthorpe when 1999 turned into 2000 and although the clothes and the stimulants might be slightly different ultimately they're just photos of anonymous people off their faces which doesn't give me much to work with. Um, however, Christmas and New Year's are traditionally times of excess. They're times when, for one reason or another, we might end up spending a lot of time in the bathroom. Uh, just before Christmas, I got food poisoning and I ended up spending a tremendous amount of time um, in this bathroom. And it got me wondering, could I do an entire episode of show and tell set in bathrooms, about bathrooms and toilets. It will be a challenge, but uh, the more I started to think about it and the more I started to investigate, uh, the more I became encouraged. Um, I found this photo by Alan Tannenbaum, which ticked two boxes at once. It was a New Year's Eve celebration in a Soho bathtub in a New York bathroom. And so I was hopeful, but I wanted to be a bit more ambitious and frankly, a bit more pretentious than just bath party photos with lots of foam. I wanted to plumb the human condition and the very depths of uh, existence via the medium of bath, bathroom and toilet photographs. And that's what I think I've done in episode 10 of Show and Tell. <laughs> So before we start looking at bathroom photos in detail, I think it's worth acknowledging that this isn't such an outrageous, ludicrous idea to begin with. Um, the bathroom has long been acknowledged as a place where people go for privacy and to contemplate and to think. Um, in 1922, in Paris, James Joyce published Ulysses, the book which changed the face of modern literature forever. Here's a portrait of Joyce by Berenice Abbott, where, dare I say it, he looks a bit constipated. He's sitting on the chair at a strange angle. And here's another photo of him by Man Ray, who we'll talk about later, where he could actually be on the toilet. I don't know, maybe I'm just being crude. What's undeniable though, is that Ulysses was controversial, partly because his writing was so explicit, and partly just because he was writing about everyday stuff that was considered taboo and hitherto unliterary. Chapter four of Ulysses is called Calypso and features a scene where Bloom goes to the toilet or sits a squat on a cuck stool, as Joyce puts it. The footage you're watching now is Stephen Ray as Leopold Bloom in a film called Bloom from 2003, which isn't very good, but does allow me to actually show you Bloom on the loo, instead of you just looking at me talking at you while sitting on my loo. Now, at the time, in the 1920s, this sort of thing was considered shocking stuff. Shocking enough that people were actually imprisoned for trying to release the book in the US and eventually it had to be published in France. This is quite a common situation for photo books as well as literature. I've already talked about how both Robert Frank's The Americans and William Klein's Life is Good for You and Good for You in New York, Trance Witness Revels were both rejected by their US publishers and eventually came out in Paris in the 1950s. So they were just following in the wet footprints, as it were, of Joyce's Ulysses. But it should also be noted that two whole years before Ulysses was published, Jacques Henry Lartige took this photo of his first wife, Madeleine B.B. Messenger, on the toilet. In fact, not only on the toilet, but on the toilet on their honeymoon at the Grand Hotel des Alpes in January 1920. Now, I have no idea if this is the very first ever person sitting on the loo photograph. It certainly is the earliest one I can find, but it's definitely not the last. 
and while I don't wish to speculate on the eventual reasons that Lartige and Bibi eventually got divorced, I would hazard that that look she's giving him as he snapped her on the throne speaks volumes. They've only just got married and already his endless, relentless photography shtick is wearing thin and starting to grate. Now, I should make it clear that I have no intention of doing an entire episode of Show and Tell of slightly titillating photos of women on the toilet peeing. That's not what this is about, and that's another episode entirely. Uh, but what, and this photo also isn't street, I think we should acknowledge that right from the start. It's a private, personal photo that over time has leaked out into the public domain. But what it does represent is photography's unique ability to expose and reveal what is usually hidden away and done in private in the bathroom. And that's why uh, photographers throughout photography history have found the bathroom a fascinating and irresistible place to come and stick their lenses. Um, no, I mentioned earlier on uh, Robert Frank and William Klein. Well, both of those great photographers have their own bathroom toilet photographs. This first one is by Klein which is simply titled Pissing, New York, 1955. And obviously it's not a classic, he could have done with a flash, but it is, or at least was, I suppose, taboo and convention busting. Frank's toilet photo from the Americans is far more famous. This was taken on the road in a men's room at a railway station in Memphis, Tennessee in 1956. And Jack Kerouac referred directly to it in his introduction to the book when he described it as the loneliest picture ever made, the urinals that women never see, the shoeshine going on in sad eternity. Which is lovely and poetic, but this photo isn't the whole story, because there's no one actually using the toilets in this shot. However, if you look at Frank's contact sheets for that day, you can see he made four exposures in that men's room in the Tennessee railway station, and that in this one here, he's also got two men pissing in the foreground right in front of him. Now this it's an incredibly ballsy shot to take in Memphis in 1956, and I actually think that the only reason it wasn't included in the book was because it looks like the bloke getting his shoe shined in the background there has looked up and busted him. He's probably thinking, why has that small Swiss bloke been standing in the corner of the toilet for so long without taking a piss? What the hell is he doing? Um, however, the most uh, bizarre and strangest toilet photograph that I think I've managed to find is this one by Gary Winogrand which was taken when he visited London in 1969 and featured in the 2016 exhibition Strange and Familiar at the Barbican in London, which looked at foreign photographers and their takes on life in the UK. Now this is a really puzzling photo because whilst it was in the exhibition, uh, it's not in the book. It's not anywhere in there that I can find. Uh, it's not in any other Winogram book that I've got. Uh, it's certainly not online anywhere, um, and it's both a mystery and annoying because it means I can only show you a rather poor quality, cheeky phone snap that I took when I was wandering around the exhibition. So this mysterious shot also raises a couple of questions. Question number one, why was this bagpiper in the toilet in the first place? And question number two, what does a bagpiper do with his bagpipes when he wants to go to the loo? Any answers, please just write them in the comments below. Uh, there's just a couple more toilet photographs to whiz through. There's this one, of course, by Joseph Kudelka from Exiles. He took this in Ireland in 1976, and it's the most tremendous, stark toilet photo you'll ever see. It's perfectly composed, with the shadow slicing the bloke at the end in half, and the way that all the other men seem to be looking down towards him. It's a photo that really pulls you in, although you wouldn't want to be pulled into this toilet because you'd probably tread in something disgusting. Now I have to admit that including this photo is cheating slightly. As I said, I was going to be looking at bathroom photos today, and strictly speaking, this is an outdoor open air lavatory, or Kazi, as old fashioned British slang might put it. The problem is, is that there are thousands and thousands of outdoor men pissing photos. Um, obviously because their backs are turned, it's a very easy target for a photographer. Uh, but I really don't want to get sucked into doing a whole thing about men weeing. But um, I will look at a few because they really are quite funny. Um, and the first subcategory to talk about is, and as it's topical as well because it was Christmas only last week, um, is pissing Santa photographs. I know, who would have thought there was such a thing, but there is. Um, so let's have a look at a few of them. This first one is by Donato Di Camillo. Actually, this one's indoors, isn't it? Um, and this, I presume, is in Italy. Um, 
This next one is by Jesse Marlowe from Australia. And finally, Craig Whitehead in London in 2018. And who would have thought this was a real thing, eh? Father Pismus. And this is a great, tragic, outdoor pissing photo by Clifton Barker in Texas. And there's even a whole sub-sub-genre of outdoor, jokey men pretend pissing water fountain photographs. This first one is by the incomparable Richard Calvar, and I presume uh, was taken in Paris. And this second one is by Penti Shamalathi, definitely taken in Paris in 2011. And the addition of the staring aghast kid there really makes this a winner. I should probably stop there and go back inside and continue to look at bathrooms and interior toilets as I initially promised. Um, and there's so many photographs of rock stars on the loo, um, it's almost a cliche. Well, it is a cliche uh, because obviously they equate being photographed at the toilet with being a rebel. So here's a photo of Joe Strummer and Mick Jones from The Clash, both having a slash, a clash slash maybe, maybe even taken with a flash, shot by Chalky Davis in 1977. And I love this bloke in the middle here, again wondering what the man with the camera is up to in the toilet. Chalky Davis also took this photograph of Sid and Nancy in his own bathroom. Toilets in photographs just seem to go hand in hand with punk. And while there are a lot of photographs of men weeing, there are, fortunately, far fewer photographs of men sitting on the toilet taking a dump. However, there is this one photo of the great Louis Armstrong from the 1940s, uh, which I found, which has an absolutely bizarre story attached to it, which is that Armstrong was a great fan of a brand of herbal laxative called Swiss Chris. And you can see him holding a packet of them there next to his cigarette. And he would swear by them. Apparently he loved his food, but he also had a lifelong weight problems. And so he became almost addicted to these laxatives, which he advertised for free. He never took a penny. Uh, for them and he would even hand out free laxatives to people that he met and you can read the um, handwritten message on this photo which reads um, to Lonnie Simmons man you can snap your ass off no shit was well, actually this be man you can snap your ass off shouldn't it ass off no shit so there you go Louis Armstrong was an unpaid brand ambassador for a herbal laxative you learn something new every day what a wonderful world um, after that, all other photographs of musicians sitting on the toilet just sort of pale into nothingness, really. Um, however, I have been able to find this photograph of a brazen Frank Zappa in the Royal Garden Hotel, taken by Robert Davidson in 1967. Presumably this was a setup and not a candid shot, so who knows whether Zappa was doing a number one or a number two or both at the same time. That mystery presumably will never be solved. And in the spirit of sexual equality, we should also probably have some female rock stars on the loo. So in chronological order, here's the great, always outspoken Millie Jackson for her 1989 album Back to the Shit, which includes tracks such as Love Stinks and Muffle That Fart, which I really urge you to go and listen to on YouTube, and I might even put a link to below, because they're absolutely hilarious. And then here's Courtney Love from Hole, sitting on a Hollywood bowl, which I believe is also slang for a toilet, in the early 1990s, photographed by Peru. So let's move off the toilet for a bit and get into the bath because frankly, I was starting to feel dirty and I could do with getting clean. Um, so there are a few distinct variations of the bath photograph. Um, the first one are clearly setups with uh, celebrities, rock stars, actors, musicians, etc where they feel that getting into the bath will make them instantly funny, likeable, and maybe even radical. So here's Ewan McGregor and Jude Law in 2003, taken by Lorenzo Aguis, and the list just goes on. Here's Bowie in the bath on the set of his least favorite film, Just a Gigolo, directed by David Hemmings. The same David Hemmings, by the way, that played a fashion photographer in Michelangelo Antonioni's Blow Up in 1969. A quick photography related bit of trivia for you there. Here's Roger Daltrey of The Who in a bath full of baked beans, photographed by David Montgomery in 1967, which is certainly different, but defeats the entire purpose of a bath, frankly. Here's the Sex Pistols in a hotel room in Holland in 1977, minus John Lydon. And you'll notice that while Steve Jones is in the bath with a lighted candelabra for some reason, the drummer, Paul Cook, has his bondage trousers on and up on the toilet. 
which is why this photo is in the bath section and not the toilet one, meaning this photo isn't anywhere near as punk as they'd like it to be. The Sex Pistols famously sang God Save the Queen, and while I don't have a photo of the late Queen in her bath, I do have one of her sister, Princess Margaret, in the bath, in her wedding tiara. So presumably this was taken on her honeymoon, and it was certainly taken by her first husband, Anthony Armstrong Jones, also known as Lord Snowden, who's partly included himself in the shot. Snowden was a very well-respected photographer, but he obviously didn't learn from the case of Jacques Henry Lartigue and Bibi, which is, don't photograph your new bride in the bathroom. It never ends well. And sure enough, Tony and Margaret got divorced in 1978. Incidentally, briefly coming back to Lartigue and Bibi, here's another photo that Lartigue took of his new bride, this time not on the loo, but in the bath. It's quite nice, this one. And like Lord Snowden, he's included himself in the mirror there. And while we're at it, here's a photo of Lartigue himself in the bath when he was just nine years old. It's a shot taken by his mother, although apparently Lartigue set everything up, set the focus and the exposure, and just got his mum to press the shutter. So we've had pop stars in the bath, we've had royalty in the bath, we've had photographers in the bath. Um, here's a few others. There's a great shot of Groucho Marx by Ouija. Foam is obviously a big concealer. Here's Salvador Dali in the bath, being all surreal by not having any water in there with him. Here's Ernest Hemingway with his broken glasses. Here's Donald Sutherland's arse, photographed by the great Mary Ellen Mark. And here's Pablo Picasso getting his back scrubbed in 1956, photographed by David Douglas Duncan. And my final celeb bath photo is this one of Robert Kappa reading a book in the bath in 1942, photographed by Myron Davis. Now, if you know your photography history, you'll know that Kappa was a great war photographer who famously said, if your photographs aren't any good, it's because you're not close enough. Although I don't think Myron Davis could have got any closer to Robert Kappa than he is in this photograph, or this other version without the book. But I still consider these photos to be missed opportunities. Because while a photo of Kappa in the bath is good, surely a photo of Kappa on the crapper would be even better. I did find this photo by Robert Kappa's brother Cornell Kappa from 1949, which is of a fairly horrid looking sink. And I thought for a moment that maybe this chair here was a commode. And so then I got all excited thinking I could say that this was a photo of a crapper by Cornell Kappa. But sadly, that's not the case. Maybe in some parallel universe somewhere, Cornell Kappa would have taken a photograph of his brother on the toilet and I would find it and then I'd be able to tell you that I've got a Robert Kappa on the crapper taken by his fraternal snapper Cornell Kappa photograph. But uh, I haven't got that and that never happened so I can't, unfortunately. Um, now, most of what I've shown you so far has not exactly been very meaty, has it? It's mainly been froth and foam. Like this photo by Martin Scholler of Jack Black in the tub in curlers with his wiener out. It's just a publicity setup. and at the start of this episode I claim to be able to delve into the human condition through bathroom photography, so I better start making good on my promise. The first thing to consider is that photography is inextricably tied to the bathroom. Uh, back when most people shot on film they needed somewhere to develop that film, and the bathroom was often the location that they chose. They needed a bath, they needed running water, they needed a sink, and somewhere that could be easily blacked out. And so over the years, uh, numerous bathrooms have doubled as dark rooms and been the birthplace for countless photographs. So here's a couple of bathroom mirror selfies taken by Vivian Mayer. And now here's a photo of her own bathroom darkroom setup taken in 1956. Bathrooms were effectively the delivery rooms for working film photographers. When William Klein came back to New York in 1955, he set up a dark room in the bathroom of his apartment. Bruce Davidson, the legendary Magnum photographer, has turned the bathroom in his New York apartment into a full-time dark room. I don't know where he has his bath. Maybe he sacrificed that luxury in the name of photography. And throughout uh, photographic history, um, numerous hotel bathrooms have been adapted and converted into dark rooms by photographers out on assignment. Here's a photograph of the French photographer Isabel Elson developing film in her bathroom in Saudi Arabia during the Gulf War in 1991. But the most famous example of all this I can think of is Nick Utz's 1972 photograph taken during the Vietnam War of a small girl who had been bombed and burned by napalm. Utt took the photograph helped the girl get to hospital 
and then went back to his hotel bathroom darkroom to develop the picture that arguably then went on to hasten the end of the Vietnam War. And several other great photographers have featured bathrooms and toilets in their photography in a far more politically and socially conscious way um, than just shooting celebs on the toilet. So these are the enlightened bathroom photographers, uh, the Illuminati, if you will. The late Charles Harbour, twice president of Magnum, took this photo in 1960 of a Lower East Side apartment and it perfectly demonstrates how photographs of bathrooms can have a political element. How is it, this photograph asks, that in the richest country in the world in 1960, people would effectively have to take a bath in their kitchens? Photographers have long documented uh, the bathroom's use as a very valuable marker of inequality and poverty. So that photograph by Charles Harbert was taken in New York in 1960. One year later, in London in 1961, the great Eve Arnold took this photo called One of Four Girls Sharing a Flat in Knightsbridge, which is absolutely beautiful, looks like a painting, but is also a great insight into the realities of flat sharing, realities that haven't changed too much over the last 60 years. Eve Arnold was always alert to the broader potential lurking within a bathroom. She might have made her name through taking intimate bathroom-based shots of Marilyn Monroe, so here they are both in a restroom in 1955, but she also had a dedicated and fierce commitment to social justice. Three years later, in 1958, she took this photo in the bathroom of a school in Virginia during a party held to introduce black and white pupils to each other, which is a different take on the ubiquitous photographer bathroom mirror selfie shot. Arnold is the distorted presence between these two young girls. And almost a decade later, in 1966, Arnold travelled to the Soviet Union and took this heartbreaking photo of political prisoners receiving enforced hydrotherapy as treatment or punishment for their views in Moscow. Another photographer who saw the use of bathrooms as a means of social commentary was Gordon Parks. Parks took this fantastic shot in 1953 for a Life magazine story of a professional couple's big family routine in their crowded bathroom, which just delivers more and more each time you look at it. But then, 15 years later, he produced a far more hard-hitting story for life about the plight of black families living in poverty in inner cities when he followed the Fontenelle household in Harlem in 1968 and recorded every aspect of their life with his camera, including this tremendous image of Rosie Fontenelle cleaning her bathtub. Life magazine, it turns out, had a long tradition of assessing the state of the nation by examining their housing and, by extension, their bathrooms. Um, as far back as 1937, they were running photographic essays that probed into every nook and cranny of housing, and the bathroom didn't escape their gaze. And the photographer who seemed to look closest was Margaret Bork White. Bork White was an amazing character who was the first ever female star photographer at Life the first ever woman to be accredited as a war reporter by the US Army, and went on to travel the globe photographing almost every serious social subject you can imagine for more than 50 years. For a while, she was one of the highest paid women in the whole of the US, but she was always alert to injustice and inequality, as this brilliant photo of hers, The American Way, demonstrates so eloquently. Um, in the same year that she took that photo, 1937, uh, Margaret Bork White shot uh, and contributed several photographs to a Life article on um, American families living in slum conditions in one-room tenement apartments. So um, this one is simply called One Room Slum of Mr. and Mrs. Max Tolslick, and you can see a bucket by the stove there, which I suppose could be a bath or a sink. And then there's another shot of their actual sink, and here is a photo of Mrs. Bates of 210 East 98th Street. And again, you can see her stove, but not her bathroom. However, Margaret Bort White did shoot some bathrooms and some toilets for that article, but I don't think uh, back in 1937, Life was actually ready to publish them. However, if you have a good rummage around on the Life Digital Archive, which is the most astonishing resource you'll ever see in your entire life, um, you can find some of those original shots. So here they are for your delectation now uh, nearly 85 years later in 2023. First off, we have what is referred to as a higher type slum, 
248 East 3rd Street, and you can see a woman actually going in to use what is almost the equivalent of a music festival indoor wooden portaloo. Then there's this shot of what's labelled Worst Type Slum 98th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue, although the cat doesn't look too bothered. And finally, there's this one, which you might want to look away from if you're of a nervous disposition, which is called Worst Type Slum Toilets 348 East 3rd Street, which is one of the most revolting toilet shots you'll ever see, and might actually go some way to explaining this amazing photo of Margaret Vaught White herself, as maybe this is the specially protected Worst Type Slum Toilet camera she used to get that shot, taking Robert Kappa's dictum of getting closer to a new extreme. So there's just one more photographer I want to take a look at today, and it's another female photographer and another contemporary actually of Margaret Bork White. In fact, here is a photo of Margaret Bork White taken by her in 1942, and that photographer is Lee Miller. Now, I've got a real problem here because Lee Miller was a truly fascinating person, and I'm in severe danger of just uh, geeking out about Lee Miller and her life and her photographs because, I mean, they really are so exceptional, um, but I just don't really have the time to do that. So I'm going to try and keep things brief ha! and uh, give you uh, a bit of a potted history about Lee Miller before I get on to her significance to this episode uh, about bathrooms. Although it is worth pointing out that um, there's quite a few early photos of Lee Miller in bathrooms anyway. So she was born in America in 1907 and her father, Theodore Miller, started taking photographs of her almost straight away, as most fathers do of their kids. Um, as you can see from this photograph of her aged seven months old on the family toilet in the family bathroom. Now, that might not seem anything unusual, uh, but the thing is that Theodore Miller um, just didn't stop taking photographs of his daughter. He just carried on and on and on, and there's absolutely hundreds of them. But we're going to jump forward um, to 1930, so 23 years after that photograph, and take a look at this, which is Lee Miller in the bathtub in the Grand Hotel Stockholm, taken on the 30th of December, also by her father, Theodore, when she was 23 years old. Now, I'm not going to comment or speculate on what was going on here, other than to say that Miller and her father obviously had a very close relationship indeed, but that she also had a very unconventional and sensational life. By the time uh, this photograph was taken in 1930, she was an incredibly successful model. The legend has it that at age 19, she was saved from being run over when Condé Nast, the publishing magnate and owner of Vogue, stopped her from stepping out in front of a car. And within weeks, she was on the front cover of Vogue in an illustration by Georges Le Pape. By 1930, when her dad was photographing her in the bath, she'd already outgrown conventional modelling and was about to embark upon the next stage of her life, hanging out with the Surrealists in Paris in the early 1930s. She was filmed by Jean Cocteau for his film The Blood of a Poet, where she appeared as a living statue torso. She became Man Ray's lover and muse, learned about photography from him, even invented solarization with him, and was even painted seven times by Picasso. Like I said, there's just so much to say about Miller's extraordinary life, and I haven't really even scratched the surface yet. Uh, when she and Man Ray broke up, uh, it took him two full years to get over her, which he spent by painting her lips floating over Paris as some kind of exorcism. Um, and then when that didn't work, he cut out a photo of her eye attached it to a metronome, called it Object to be Destroyed, and wrote this set of instructions. Cut out the eye from a photograph of one who has been loved but is seen no more. Attach the eye to the pendulum of a metronome and regulate the weight to suit the tempo desired. Keep going to the limit of endurance. With a hammer well aimed, try to destroy the whole at a single blow. So this is all very well, I hear you say, but what has any of this got to do with bathrooms? Well, I'll try and explain. By the outbreak of the Second World War, uh, Miller had moved from Paris back to New York, set up a photography studio, then moved to Egypt and married an older, wealthy Egyptian called Aziz Eloi Bey. She continued taking photographs with a surreal element, like this famous shot Portrait of Space from 1937, which directly inspired René Magritte's famous painting The Kiss from 1938. By the time war broke out, she had left Bay and moved to London to be with the British surrealist 
Roland Penrose, who encouraged her to continue developing her photography. She met Margaret Bourke White and photographed her, and then managed to become one of only six accredited female war correspondents attached to the US Army. She was also taking war photographs for Vogue, which is a truly astonishing achievement when you consider that she was a fashion model for them just 12 years earlier. Miller teamed up with a younger but experienced life photographer called David E. Sherman, and the pair soon became notorious for getting to important stories before any other reporters. Here's a photo of Sherman by Miller in 1942 called Dressed for War, which instantly illustrates how war makes everything look surreal, and that Miller's surrealist training in Paris in the 30s was the perfect preparation for taking photos like these. Miller not only took photos, but she also wrote articles for Vogue, and she developed a real hatred of the Nazis based on what she and Sherman had seen on their travels through Europe. Uh, they were some of the first reporters and photographers to go to the concentration camps of Dachau and Buchenwald, and the things that Miller saw there scarred her for life. And it's a testament to both her insistence and the foresight of Vogue's legendary designer Alexander Lieberman who, remember, would go on to discover William Klein a decade later, that the world's leading fashion magazine was willing to publish photographs and spreads like this, which would help show the public the awful realities of the Holocaust. On the 30th of April 1945, just one day after Miller and Sherman had been at Dachau, they gained access to an address in Munich, Prince Regent Plaza 27 a seemingly ordinary building that also happened to be the private address and abode of Adolf Hitler. And it was here that Miller was involved in one of the most controversial and notorious, but I would also argue powerful and meaningful photographs of the war and maybe even the 20th century. Miller took a bath in Hitler's tub and Sherman photographed it. She later joked that it was the only place with hot running water in all of Germany. But there is so much more going on in this photo and it's really worth having a proper think about what we're looking at here. The first thing to bear in mind is something that Miller and Sherman had no way of knowing, but which is very significant, which is that earlier that morning, Hitler and Eva Braun had committed suicide. Now, why is this fact important? Well, other than it meant there was no way he was going to goose step in and demand to know what the hell they were doing with his loofah, it is significant because it meant that the war was still going on. Germany didn't surrender for another full week, and the war didn't end for several more months until Japan surrendered in September. So these photographs were set up very much as an act of defiance. You can see Miller has placed the official publicity photo of Hitler by Heinrich Hoffmann on the side of the tub, but she's looking away. And there, on the clean white bath mat, are Miller's boots, still filthy with the dirt of Dachau. Miller said she washed the dust of Dachau off in Hitler's bath, and let's not forget that when concentration camp prisoners were taken to gas chambers in Dachau, Auschwitz and elsewhere, they were fooled into thinking they were going to be washed clean. They would be led through a door like this, marked Brausbad, which means shower or shower room before being gassed. So for a woman and her partner, who was also a Jew, to go and take a bath in Hitler's private bath to muddy his mat with the, their dirty boots that came from Dachau on the very same day that he'd committed suicide is basically one of the greatest fuck yous in photographic history. Um, Hitler got owned, as I believe the youth of today might say. And if you look at the contact sheet, you'll see that it's not just Miller who took the bath, but David Sherman also got in there and had a good scrub. These photos are so much more radical and meaningful than any subsequent rock star or writer or artist or actor in the bath photos that have followed on. These images are real punk. They are truly transgressive. And the astonishing thing is we may never have seen them um, after they were taken. And I should add, actually, that I don't know where they were developed. I would love to think that uh, after having that bath, Miller and Sherman turned Hitler's bathroom into a dark room and developed them in his sink. But sadly, I don't think that's the case. The truth is that after the war, Lee Miller rapidly sank into depression. She worked for a couple of more years, but she was always haunted by the terrible things she'd witnessed and photographed in Europe. She married Roland Penrose and became Lady Penrose, and they lived together in the UK 
but with her entire photographic archive boxed up and forgotten in her attic. She became a cookery writer and an alcoholic. It wasn't until after her death in 1977, at the age of 70, that her son Anthony discovered all her negatives and journals and realised what an extraordinary life his mother had led. And the earliest record, the earliest time I can find that first bathroom photo being released to the public um, is from 1980, which is a full 35 years after it was taken. Incidentally, Kate Winslet has just finished shooting a feature film about Lee Miller, so maybe in a year or two when it gets released, I'll do a review of that. So that was my show and tell uh, bathroom special, which once again turned out to be a far longer endeavour than I had originally planned. Um, thanks for watching. It's the first film of 2023, but it definitely won't be the last. I've got loads more planned, although I'm probably going to take a couple of weeks off now because I need to go and earn a living. Now, if I've done this right, uh, this would be two boxes appearing either side of my head with some of the other films that you can watch that I've made already. Um, obviously, technically, I'm not very adept, which I think you can probably guess. Uh, so these boxes might not be appearing, they might appear later on in the credits. But anyway, uh, click on them, have a look through the uh, other films that I've made. And yeah, thanks for watching. Any comments, please write them down below. Please subscribe. And uh, yeah, see you soon. Bye.